It's not a place you just show up and get a Kelly Slater perfect wave, cool wave. Like think about all the crazy stuff that's happened at Nazareth that we've never even talked about. There was landmines all over the beach from the Civil War. And there was fully a gunfight and you had to like run for cover. And we were all just going like, let's go climb some dunes, find some diamonds. How long have we been talking about this? Like Probably six months years. or something? It's been years since we wanted to start something. I mean, I thought about it a long time ago, and I think now that we're doing it, it might be too late, but let's just get on here and share some stories, our experiences, and maybe someone can take, you know, something from it, or hopefully maybe just be entertained for a couple of minutes. I, I just want to hear about your travels over the past month. I think like it was almost like the old days before, you know, you had kids and before you had a wife, like you were just gone all the time. And that's kind of how it felt like, I think all of what was last month, July yeah, and, and into August. Well, before I had kids and was married and even had a house, seven months on the road, a lot of it was for like sponsorship obligations. And then of course the stand up paddling was really big. So stand up paddle world tour. Um, and it's fun because you don't realize how good the journey is until afterwards. And I did miss um, just being able to go from spot to spot, but really I'm starting to get back in the rhythm of traveling. Um, it's great because my job an excuse is to go get good waves and I'm not necessarily competing really, although I'd really like to be on some sort of world tour, <laughs> which I think I could. There's a couple tours going on. It's just hard to dedicate the training time to one thing i'm kind of obsessed with just doing everything but i did actually end up going on the slab tour which is nathan florence's surfing quest but of course he invited me to the farthest place on planet earth from maui um, which was namibia pretty much well anywhere in africa actually but it was namibia and it didn't end up being really slabs, but ended up being kind of perfect long waves. Um, so we called it the Small Wave World Tour because we went to Walvis Bay, Donkey Bay, Skeleton Bay. There's a bunch of different names for it. But that was really, really fun. And it was cool to see how he sort of operates and how he makes his decisions on where to go and what to do. Yeah, I mean, like, I think anybody that consumes surf media knows about the slab tour i'm definitely one of those people that watches these like 40 minute long like dry vlogs like there's no there's no editing to it it's really feels like you're there with them so like i guess my question would be like is it actually like that or does he do anything different <laughs> when the camera's on or like what's the actual vibe behind the scenes of those i think what makes nathan's vlog sort of work is it's just like the most honest filming you've ever seen they're not really focused on this high level production value even though zord his filmer is an incredible cinematographer flies a drone amazing shoots well on land but they're really just like kind of documenting everything so you kind of gotta just like always know that there might be a camera on you which is pretty fun and those guys don't like to edit anything out um so if you do something embarrassing or if you do something funny it'll probably end up in it um and so you know it's just, I don't know. It, it, it was really loose. And on this trip, we had big wave legend Cole Christensen with us. And he's just so hilarious because here's a veteran who's traveled the world with the likes of many big wave riders. And I think that generation was a bit more serious. And of course, they're funny too, but I don't think they were as like, as much like Nathan and I, which are pretty much making jokes the whole time. You know, we're going to bed at eight o'clock. So it's it's a very <laughs> different maybe uh thing we don't go out and party um but that just because we're so focused on what we're trying to do and he was just like i think he'd have these quiet spells where he wouldn't say it many words because he was like considering if this was the right decision for him to come on a trip with <laughs> us but at the end i think he had kind of a lot of fun so yeah that's sad. yeah i i always thought it was so funny like you two guys are probably some of like the gnarliest big wave surfers in the world and I think the stereotype, especially since we grew up, like maybe more of Cole's generation is like, these guys are so serious. They're out, you know, just stone cold, just not talking to anybody out in the lineup. And like, you guys will be out at Jaws talking about like Pokemon or something like that. <laughs> like, it's just hilarious. Or like well, Star Wars and you're like, it's just crazy. I, you know, definitely Nathan and I, we've talked about this. You definitely get some funny looks, especially in the early days of trying to ride big waves because 
these you know guys that were so i mean it's not that we're not focused but they take it so seriously that you know you end up not catching a wave and you know this you're out there out of jaws or any big wave and it could be an hour lull i mean big waves there's really only like three giant perfect waves that will come in in a session i mean there could be more for sure but like the standout waves that will get you right a year nominations or biggest wave um there's only a handful that come in and there's a long wait so instead of just like staring at the horizon it's fun to like basically break the mood up i guess you know albie Lair called it nervous laughter for one of his films and it's true you're just kind of laughing nervously because <laughs> you're scared and i think we're all pretty open to how scary it is but then when a wave comes we're not as focused on the consequences or survival we're more focused on the performance and that kind of hides the dangers from you because in that moment you just got to commit if you don't commit fully you're probably not going to make it and you know, the one thing you were trying to avoid the whole time is going to become, you know, the reality. Uh, and and so, yeah, I mean, those those guys, those legends that paved the road, I think it was like they had to do something no one had ever done. And, you know, we're kind of reaping the benefits of the safety equipment. Everything is so good nowadays. And, yeah, it's um, it's fun to surf with someone like him because it keeps the mood light and it keeps it fun. I don't know if we would be surfing big waves if it wasn't fun i don't see a point in doing it otherwise ever since you got me into it a few years ago i think that was like always my number one thing where it's like yeah it's terrifying there's so much consequences that the only way i'm ever gonna go out is if it's if it's fun you know because like you said yeah there's literally no point like if you're going out there to like prove something or like get the clip or whatever um it's probably not gonna be for the right reasons and yeah like just some of the conversations you hear out at jaws like not just you guys but yeah, I think everybody sort of is on that high too, especially if someone gets a good wave. Like um, the vibe is actually like shockingly pretty lighthearted out there, which I don't think I, I never It never used that. to be. I think now really? it is. The next yeah. generation sees it. And it's honestly fun. I don't know. That's what was fun about having Cole on our trip is we were borderline like making fun of him because he's just, you know, he's early fifties and he's um, still charges giant waves, but he has a calmer demeanor and, um, Nathan and I are just constantly quoting memes along with Zord. <laughs> and so, you know, I was just, that's what's fun though. You kind of can feed off of other people's energy, whether it's like, you know, the legend out the back, cause they become myth more than they are person. Um, and that's for the longest time too. Like it was, you, if you didn't see a big wave legend out there, maybe they weren't, you know, committed to big waves as much as they used to, but also the fact that, they might appear out of nowhere because they're notorious for that. And you're just kind of waiting for someone to, you know, come over the horizon and ride the biggest wave of the day. Just no flotation vest or anything, but kind of back to like our trip. I mean, I'm really, I was always, I'm really impressed with how Nathan will just see a swell on the charts and just kind of send it. And when you get into that rhythm, it's actually not that hard to do. You just got to be comfortable with being on an airplane and, um, when we were going to Namibia, the funny thing was, is he didn't decide to go until two hours before the flight, which, you know, he has a 45 minute drive from the North shore to get to the airport. And so he's probably checking in with an hour and 10 minutes before the flight departs. And he literally didn't make the decision. And I had made it, you know, maybe 12 hours earlier. Cause I was just like, you know what? I'm buying it. I'm committed. Let's just go. And he was just back and forth. And I wouldn't have gone if he didn't go. But at the same time, um, I was like, I pressured him into going a little bit because I was like, oh, I'm ready. I'm going. And he's like, oh, okay. And because he he's, he's going to have the FOMO if you score too and he doesn't go. Well, he was going to, he wanted to go to Namibia. And then he also was like looking at Australia at all the slabs. And, you know, I've always wanted to do the slab tour with him. And then we ended up looking for some slabs around J Bay. So there's a bunch of like coastline there, but it feels so sharky because it's just deep underwater cliffs and we saw some slabs that it looked like if it was just lower tide when we were there we could have surfed um but you know he was describing it as pretty sketchy because there was kind of some like game reserves um so we're kind of like elephants and animals can go mm. with without being disturbed so you'd have to like either walk along the coastline or paddle and if you got hurt you'd be like in a game reserve with possibly lions <laughs> and so yeah, it's, it's like, like 
Sharks and lions. So gnarly. Yeah, that's like this crazy thing about some of the waves like Nathan's surfed recently is like he's literally paddling by himself. Maybe somebody is filming with like a drone from super far away or something. But yeah, the consequences are just insane for like those types of slabs. I don't know if I'd ever feel safe doing that, but he's just like so sendy that he just like I mean, it makes it work somehow. Well, I think he was feeling a little FOMO because, well, we did score. We got awesome skeleton bait, although... You know, since the first time it was surfed, uh, maybe like 2010 or 12 or whatever it was, it the sand has changed a lot. Um, actually, flying in and flying out, you just look. We we went along the coastline, and you could just see there's other skeleton bays everywhere. I mean, it's the oldest desert in the world supposedly, um, and but there's more waves. Just getting to those places is pretty gnarly. Um, but that being said, we got great waves in Namibia. Actually, I mainly kite surfed. And I was so happy I threw in a kite because, you know, I've been there before and I knew it got windy and there's nothing worse than being somewhere and not having equipment. And I, although I still wish I had my windsurf equipment, it's just windsurfing equipment for a strike mission like that is just too hard. And I didn't want to burden Nathan with my four board bags. So I opted down for about two. Um, but yeah, then J-Bay was fun. It wasn't as big. It was kind of crowded. Um, and we still had a ton of fun, but he, I think, might have overcorrected because right now he's in Brazil and he's trying to ride this wave of the shock. And he literally texted me, I think I broke my back again. And he sent me a photo of just this absolute closeout and oh. just so sketchy. <laughs> I want to know more about um, about Skeleton Bay. Like, I feel like I feel like I've and I'm sure a lot of people have like grown up just thinking that is the most perfect best wave in the world. Like you see the Koa Smith like GoPro clips where he's like in the barrel for 30 seconds. Like it looks like it just cannot get better than that. And I feel like a lot of people have that preconceived notion that it's just always perfect, always firing, easy to surf. How does that perception differ from like reality? Did you think it was going to be like that going into it? Well, it's funny because that place is really far to get from Hawaii. Um, and that's like, you know, you try to strike a swell. There's some nuances to the swells you want and it's very rare to get it perfect. Um, a lot of times you kind of want to go when there's a little bit of wind because the fog will just block out everything. And one of our first sessions out there, I could barely see my hand in front of my face. And Nathan and I were paddling out. He actually went ahead and I couldn't see him. And it's the type of lineup. It's actually two miles long, the wave, which is pretty crazy. So if you catch a wave and you get to the bottom where there's these kind of kind of right into a closeout that meets the left it's a two mile walk, which is pretty far. And, and we ended up walking, I think something like 32 miles or surfing and walking 32 miles over the course of a day. It's like Insane. eight hours surf, but it's, it gets so foggy that you can't see the waves coming and it adds to the mysteriousness of the place. Um, because you see skulls and dead seals everywhere and there's jackal running across the beach and you're like, am I going to get attacked? Like, <laughs> it's not that it's dangerous or feels dangerous. I mean, it does feel pretty sharky out there because there's a you're surfing right next to a seal colony with 2,000 seals. Um, but all that being said, when we were paddling out, Nathan got caught inside and broke his brand new board he had never surfed and disappeared. And I didn't even know he broke it. And then it was Coa Smith who was already out there, and I kind of drifted towards him. He said he had broken his board and. It's the type of wave you go out with friends, but you'll probably never surf with them because the current is 10 knots. So over, you're just praying a set comes to you and you can ride that wave as far as you can um, because I did multiple runs where I didn't even catch a wave. And by the time you're like looking at the beach, you can't see where the cars are because the cars usually park three quarters of the way up or in the middle. And, um, and, and all of a sudden I just saw this right and this closeout coming in and it felt like Puerto Escondido 10 foot. And you could break your board pretty easily. So it was like managing, trying not to, to go in. But that's usually just early morning and it's so cold there. Oh my gosh. Or it can be because it's winter now, you know, middle of summer for us. But, um, you know, that place when the wind comes, it blows just offshore. So the waves, you know, still quite surfable. But to get to the point of what you were saying, it's not a place you just show up and get a Kelly Slater perfect wave pool wave. I mean, I swear that the problem with that spot is you end up believing that and thinking that because you watch all these edits, but it is so hard to see a good or get a good wave. You end up seeing a good wave all the time and it's just out of reach. And because it's kind of like a sanctuary, the area, you're not allowed to use sea or jet skis. Um, and 
it's very you know that would just solve your problem <laughs> you'd get so 100%. many barrels it's kind of why i ended up leaning into the kiting although i it was hard to kind of get barreled on the kite because the way it was so fast and it wasn't quite offshore enough to like keep tension in the lines it was nice because i could just find the craziest wave and ride it and at least i was riding it and doing turns but um and getting little cover-ups um so that place has a lot of nuances to it and you know the most wild thing is is in town you feel like you're in germany I remember the early edits made it seem like you had to do some like crazy mission across a hundred miles of desert, but it's like not, it's kind of more accessible than I think people realize. Yeah. Well, the accessibility is, I mean, if you're in Europe or if you're on the East coast, it's definitely like not as much of a mission, uh, but it is, I'm going to break, make a breaking, you know, secret here. It's like all good waves are usually by harbors and, or all big waves, That's especially, true. but usually there's a town right next door and there is just this German like town right at the wave. You could literally stay at like maybe, you know, an Airbnb that's like five star or whatever, or like a nice, you know, decent hotel right there and watch the wave peel across the sand. Bank. Cause it's like no the biggest, I think it's the biggest port in Namibia. And so everywhere you look, there's like massive ships, um, you know, oil tankers, uh, container ships. I mean, you're really right on the edge of a desert when you fly in. You're 40 minutes from the wave, and you can rent a sweet four by four. And it's actually like probably just as convenient as trying to go surf in Nazare almost, because you think Nazare is in this you know coastline, but it's not right at this town. And there's a harbor, and it's the best harbor to ever launch a jet ski. And if you wanted to launch a jet ski, you know there at Walvis, if you could it would be you know tremendously easy i mean the kiteboarding inside the bay is incredible super smooth water i mean the restaurants are insane wow. it's not once you're there you're like i don't kind of want to leave i mean they do huge film production shoots there too so when you got like like dune and stuff is that like kind of well, where dune they did was it? filmed in jordan i believe um oh, okay. but like uh, mad max fury road yeah, was filmed yeah. in namibia and it's not very hard to go a little bit into the desert and uh, and and find empty dunes. And we ended up going to this one called Dune Seven, which is like the tourist dune. And um, we ended up filming, and and I got all these clips, and it made me look like I was in the middle of the the desert. And it was a time constraint <laughs> thing. Of course, we'd like to have done that and go find other waves, but you know, it was just kind of from the airport to the town, so it's pretty sick. But the what I heard is if you go far enough into the desert, the sand it's so windy that diamonds that are you know forged in the desert or around there roll to the top and you could actually find diamonds on the tops no of these way. sand dunes and um and that was like kind of a, a cool thing and we were all just going like let's go climb some dunes find some diamonds but yeah <laughs> we were there for different types of diamonds barreling waves <laughs> yeah that's that's like i think that was like the shock most shocking thing to find out about Nimit or like about skeleton bay was that there is like a town your body makes you think like okay that's like so convenient it's right there and it's like one of the best waves in the world but you wonder like there's all that coastline especially oh, well, in africa that's like you can't get to and there's probably like like you said at the start like there's probably like 12 other freaking skeleton bays along that coast probably i mean actually you know the i could see you're by a harbor and there's like a big probably trench and you know there's like oil rigs out there too and and so you're like yeah. There's a lot of the way the water flows in there. I could see that, but there's so many other points. And I mean, the previous trip I went on, we did go do a little bit of exploring and we surfed some, you know, shorter points that were just as rippable as world-class waves, you know, like it's Indo in the wow. desert sort of thing, just a little bit colder. And I mean, you'll see blue whale bones on the beach. So these hundred foot whales, just bones sticking out. And that's why they call it the skeleton coast. And, um, the bay itself, your surfing's, I guess, called Donkey Bay, um, mm. but they always called it Skeleton Bay, and maybe it was to deter people because there's another Skeleton Bay. I don't know. The, it's really the South Africans that surf there mostly. Um, and it's, I heard it was I heard it was windsurfers that found it. Is that true? Probably. I mean, back in the day, Namibia is known for being the one of the windiest places on earth, and all the speed records are broken for sailing. And I'm when I mean sailing, I mean oh, windsurfing, yeah. kiteboarding, and actually sailing too. Like they've made these like crazy boats that, um, cause it gets 60 knots. And so that's why I was like, okay, I'm bringing a wing, one wing and one kite. I can fit that as padding into my board bag. And I brought like 
a general size because which was for my kite was a seven meter ozone enduro which has a huge range it's kind of a c-shaped surf kite um and it basically if it's any lighter than a seven i'll probably be surfing and if it's any windier than a seven i figured it was going to be just shredded blown out sort of thing um at that wave so i was like okay the seven's the right size it ended up being the perfect size kite for there maybe an eight meter would have been good um but the seven felt great um and then with the wing i brought a three five because we we're going to j bay and i saw my buddy cash from here on Maui, he rides, uh, he went and ri rode some insane waves there. And I was like, I want to do that too. But it didn't end up being that big or that windy. And it was a lot more crowded when we were there. Um, but it's always nice to just have it. Actually, it Cole Christensen kites, He where he lives on Oahu, uh, Mokalai is like, you know, a windy place. And, and so he can kite at his house. But um, he ended up borrowing someone's gear. Um, he wanted to borrow oh, mine no and I was like, you could borrow mine, but I might after I'm done using it and I ended up just kiting for hours and hours and he found someone and, and now it inspired Nathan cause he was ended up sitting on the beach for a good portion of it. Just going like, I need a kite. So he's going to learn how to kite surf and That's him and Zord I'd and Zord is a that. really good skydiver. So here he has the canopy control. Um, and so, yeah, he wants to learn how to kite cause I'm like, dude, it doesn't really weigh anything in your bags. Just where you can ride your surfboard and you can just use your kite as padding. And it's just like, if it's windy, at least you're out there having fun. And, uh, and that's why I brought the kite. I, if I didn't bring the kite, my trip would have been, I think a lot different. It ended up being like one of the more incredible kite trips I've ever had. <laughs> and it was meant to be yeah, just no, barrels I, for surfing. Yeah. Sometimes you go on surf trips and all, I think a lot of surfers would experience that where if, yeah, it's blown out, your trip is pretty much just blown you know so like i guess having those backups is always probably well that's nice and normally i always bring a out. foil too like yeah i feel like if i'm going on a surf trip like indo you kind of got to go really look for wind to find wind there and it's insane but it's like really really a mission um but if i'm like in bali and we do strike mission somewhere if i just have a foil as like my alternative craft i'm always covered because if it's small, oh. it's just the insane for foiling. Yeah, but you you went and winged, and it was like it was like six feet and draining. How was that? Well, I just felt like I had to go wing it because it was like it was just you were there, and I already got so much good kiting and got some barrel surfing. But it was such a sweeping current, and it was like kind of sick and tired of going back and forth up and down that two <laughs> yeah. mile beach. So I was like, I gotta try to foil it, and maybe like. I can get kind of in the pocket and if I feel like it let go and just get a barrel for a little bit, but because of the Very wind, sick. it was making it a little crumbly. Um, and you know, with the wing, it wasn't, it was hard cause I was going backside. I was going regular most of the time and the wing just didn't fit in the curvature of the wave cause it was so hollow. It definitely didn't, the foil would have been fun just without it, but I didn't want to at the same time lose my wing, which, Kind of by the end, I did try to go for a pocket ride and then like start going over the falls with my wing and undid the strap because earlier it like yanked on my arm super hard and I didn't want to pop the wing too and it ended up taking off. But luckily the waves are so relentless there. It just kind of kept it on shore. It just went a mile down the beach and I had to like <laughs> actually proned into a wave and actually got the craziest like pocket ride i've ever gone on a foil where i thought i was gonna die for at least 200 no yards way. the problem was is where zord was filming you didn't really get it and it's, it doesn't matter really but i used a wave to get to my wing and then by the time i got in it took off again so i had to run down the beach and leave my foil on the on the sand but not the best winging wave when it's barreling i thought it was probably maybe for wind sports the best kiting spot and then i wish i had my windsurf gear because although you're not getting barreled, you'd just be getting the longest waves and just slamming the lip and hitting sections. And it would have been really fun to ride. I think I'd have to do another trip there one day to to try to windsurf. There was two windsurfers from South Africa that were killing it. And um, it was it was pretty cool to see. Yeah, that's sick. And then before that, what was your trip before that? Was that Bali? Yeah, we went, we went to Bali for a month. And um, just I, we always go with the family, but I ended up getting to surf that wave yo-yos on west uh sumbawa and it was um fun because i was with dusty Payne, who's my brother-in-law and he basically was 
just doing massive airs, CT level surfing, but he had kind of cut his teeth as a free surfer with all the hardcore surf movies that we kind of grew up on, like Modern Collective and stuff at that wave. And it was a lot more crowded nowadays than when he was there, but it was just fun to be there and do some strikes. And it was a big deal, kind of a big deal for me on that trip because I got to really put my shaping skills, my boards, my first ever two short boards to the test down there and see if it was, I think if they were bad, I'd probably have given up on them a little bit. Like, uh, I'm going to leave it to, you know, the shapers I get to work with, like Keith Taboul and all those guys. But they ended up working and it's kind of, you know, sent me into this rabbit hole a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, I want to, I want to get into the shaping because I saw you in your shaping bay um, the other day and it was, uh, it was a trip. I, I remember when I first, you, you came home from that trip with another board because I think you broke your first hand shape and uh, you scanned it, right? And, and basically turned it into like a um, CNC shape. Yeah. So I made my first hand shape and you know, I just like did not watch anything on how to shape. I just kind of like knew a, kind of the general process of shaping. And I ended up shaping this shortboard. It was a 510. I thought it was 18 and three quarters. It ended up being 19. And I thought it was like two and three eighths. It ended up being like two and a quarter because I went for an ultra flat deck, not a dome deck at all. And the board was absolutely insane. I mean, looking back on it, it could have had maybe like quarter inch more rocker. But the great thing was is I had the force. I'm like, okay, I'm going to Indo and the slight chance that I end up breaking this board, I want to have the file for it. And so I had it scanned before I went. And so I was, as I was writing the board, I was like making subtle revisions to the scan, you know, maybe changing the rail a little bit. Um, I made the board super bladed out. It was very thin nose and tail. And I think that was a benefit. So I sort of left that added a little more nose rocker and a little more tail rocker, just barely. Um, and uh, after I buckled it, trying to do a huge alley-oop and just not committing to the landing because I was afraid of buckling it, so I landed on the top and ended up buckling it. I was super sad, but I was also relieved that I had scanned it. And then at the same time, I knew, okay, if I bring it home, I could get it fixed. And uh, ended up connecting because I got boards from Keith uh, Tubul KT Surfing, um, it was from a factory down there called Surf Formula. Um, and it was just the the whole operation they have is insane down there. They blow their own foam. They put the wood stringers in their own foam. And it's a start to finish process. And so while I was surfing with Dusty, I was able to send the file over exactly what I wanted, the changes. And by the time I got back to Bali, I picked up the board. I didn't get to surf it in Bali because the waves went one. Well, they went small, but then also I left. We went to the ESPYs in Los Angeles and we uh, ended up accepting a award on behalf of the Maui surfing community, which was cool. Um, and then it was, uh, you know, kind of a little backs around that. I had my two twin daughters who were two years old on a 16 and a half hour flight. That's insane. And it was like, I was like fearing that for days, but they ended up doing insane the whole way. And they only really? freaked out 30 minutes at the end. So yeah, long story short, that board that I got from there, my file after they built the whole thing, it ended up being absolutely magic. This thing is just an absolute blade. When I first got it, I was almost bummed because it seemed kind of thin. And I was like, yeah. oh man, I blew it. Like, I can't believe it. Because you know, and the funny thing is I could just make another one sort of thing, but it was like, I want the board now. And uh, I ended up surfing at J Bay. I ended up surfing at Kelly Slayer Surf Pool. And I ended up surfing it at Trestles. And the board has just been like my favorite in my entire quiver. <laughs> yeah, I remember we went and surfed. I think it was it was after you got back from Bali, but before your last missions. And we were surfing like a tiny south swell. It was probably like waist high. I had like my full on groveler, like the board I've been riding all summer that is like meant for like knee high waves. And I... I saw your board and I'm like, you're going to try to ride that thing out here. Like it was like the most like, I, to me, it looked just like the most chipped out standard shortboard. What was that thing 5.11 or something? 5.10. And, yep. Yeah. And then, and then you're like, oh, let's switch. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll give it a go is like own shape. And honestly, like, I'm sorry to say, but like, I did not expect much from it. Like I knew you have a ton of potential as being a really good shaper. But when I first stood on that board, I was like shocked. It was faster than my groveler out there which is like saying something because i feel like i that thing's pretty darn fast and 
um, immediately was just like, wow, this might be one of the better short boards I have ever written in my life. And I was just like, I couldn't couldn't believe it because my expectations, like especially on that day, maybe if it was like firing, I would have had a high expectation, but it was like it was pretty darn impressive. So like, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm psyched. And now and now I, uh, I I'm going to be able to get one custom from you, which is which is pretty cool to be riding one of your boards. So uh, I'm psyched on that. It's funny because, um, and thank you for that, but it's funny because I, when I was shaping the board and I've always had this philosophy, well, not always had it, but I've kind of like, you know, came to this conclusion is like the most important thing in surfing or pretty much in any sport is speed. You want to have as much speed as you can and then figure out how to like be comfortable at speed. And then you want your equipment to be really comfortable to the point where you don't feel like you're going fast because it feels too stable. So my going into it, I wanted a board that was going to be really fast and very forgiving. And that's what I kind of focused on hand shaping. And then when I made some slight modifications, I wanted to make sure that the board could just go on rail tremendously easy. And so the way I look at it is the most important thing on a surfboard and, you know, is the rocker for one, the rail rocker, which is different than the centerline rocker. And then... I think it would go like concaves and, and how deep you go and, and where they start and where they end. And then um, how thin the board is, like how chipped out it is. Actually, I would put maybe like the foiling of a board before, I would say, it, it, I'll put that in third, right after rail rocker is foiling and then bottom contour and then rail shape. And the reason why I say that is because on the hand shape board, I didn't why i made the brills super boxy as an experiment and they ended up feeling just it didn't like the rail felt didn't get in the way because everything else worked so good and then when i changed the rail a little bit on the file and made it kind of a little more pinched a little more traditional it felt better for sure but at the same time i think it lives and dies in the rocker rail rocker and foiling because it's so thin in the nose and so thin in the tail all the volumes really between my stance um that allows the board to be super responsive and super forgiving and not catchy and because the rocker is so good it actually paddles faster than a board that's a leader more that doesn't have as great rocker you know and and i take i pick that up from like body surfing you know you can swim really fast if you have you know good body positioning when you're swimming your head's not straight up you're actually like you know taking notes from olympic swimmers but like it's just that the rocker really is what's defining it yeah 100 percent. like i think for me at least yeah the like you said the speed if you get as much speed out of a board it just gives you a lot of options like if you're struggling to find speed the whole time i feel like you're just gonna be um you know really trying to utilize the wave and and forcing it and that's not really what you want to do you want to have a board i feel like that you know, you can do anything, you can make any decision and that lets you sort of surf on automatic versus like manual, like, okay, I got to set up my bottom turn here, well, hit this lip so I get the speed. After the trip, I flew back here and then back home and then went to the surf ranch. I got to surf with Jamie O'Brien there. And then, and the surf ranch isn't a great gauge because it's kind of like wake surfing if the wake was just overhead. It kind of feels the same way. Um, but like I got to go warm up at Trestles with, um john john florence he ended up going right after there to fiji for the final event and but he's getting ready for the wsl finals and you know it's super fun talking to him about his equipment he's super into it even though i feel like everyone sees him as such a laid-back guy he's like he's there ahead of time making sure his equipment whether he's riding a pu or a carbon board um you know and i'm not going to spill any of his secrets because he told me <laughs> quite a bunch leading up to it but that being said, um, uh, I don't know where I was going with it really, but it was just like testing that board with alongside with him and then seeing the speed difference. That's where I was thinking is like yeah, the yeah. speed difference of a guy on the WCT versus just a really good surfer and even an average surfer. Speed's the key. Um, I, and I think a lot of boards nowadays, short boards are designed to turn at any speed and the problem I see with that is a lot of times you feel like you're ripping and then you see a clip and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm sucking so hard. And what that usually is, is like, there's a little more tail rocker. There's a little more curve between the fins. 
um you know the concaves are pretty deep uh, which is good for lift and stuff and and you kind of get the forgiveness from you know having a little more tail rocker and it turns on a dime but then you'd stop throwing a lot of spray unless you're one of these very few pro surfers that can surf anything i mean you could literally put these guys on any board whether i think it's good or bad they're going to be throwing buckets and ripping but that's for you know a select few and 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 so that's why on my boards when you look at them they're very constant very consistent and they're on the rockers and they're very they're almost boring a little bit they're they're just really clean and i've really felt the best boards i've ever had are ones that are just super clean and that's what gives you forgiveness and if i could have a board that allows me to go faster i can do better turns so yeah at the end of the day i think if you're trying to get good or rip um you just want to focus on speed first and and then you know the turning comes with that easier i was about to say the same thing because yeah it is you can't do any high level tricks whatsoever in surfing unless you have like kind of a lot of speed and more speed than you'd think starting off surfing it's like just the speed you get from the wave is pretty exhilarating but to do what these guys do with like big airs full rotations even like a blow tail you need to have so much more speed than you think and i feel like getting correct me if i'm wrong but like getting going really fast on a surfboard will force you to have good style. You're gonna have to take that high line that looks really nice and you're gonna have to have your body position so you're like oriented in a certain way to get that speed. So yeah, any surfers that are trying to improve, like I think that's the biggest tip you could possibly have is just like try to go as fast as possible and worry about all the tricks later, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and the best way to do that is like, most people wanna go straight to a shortboard. Um, I think like if you go from learning on a longboard and you also have a shortboard and you play around with it, but actually going on like a mid length, um, that it it's it gets you in the waves and it gets you in early, and learning how to pump a bigger board. Longboards are kind of hard to pump, but like a mid length, you really it teaches you how to generate a lot of speed. And there's and a like lot picking of picking lines too. Yeah, and so I think like not just okay, I'm gonna be a shortboarder. I'm only gonna ride a shortboard. Now you kind of want to go like ride your shortboard and then go back and ride like a mid length. And of course, a longboard too teaches you big board control, but that's kind of later with turns. I think, um, you know, it's, there's so much to unpack in surfing and I, I'm, I've, I'm discovering so much as I shape because I, I do, I was always inspired by like the Jerry Lopez's, uh, I mean that era where there was no real surf shops. They kind of created it. Um, but they were their own board builders. They were their own shapers and they would make their equipment and they'd go out and ride it and develop and test it. And, and that feels so complete for me as a surfer, as a water person, I actually, right now I just finished designing and shaping a, um, windsurfing board. That's literally based off of my shortboard. And fortunately, um, KT and work Quattro, the windsurfing company is helping me build it. Cause it's like a sandwich gnarly construction with carbon and i haven't quite evolved to that point yet but one day maybe that's crazy I, I i could definitely foresee you just ending up having like at least one board in your quiver a few boards for every single sport and eventually i feel like that's the natural progression of where this is going well, which I, is which is exciting i don't think i'll shape or design anything until i like am riding and i have an epiphany of what i would want to do not i'm not going to be like okay i'm gonna make every board for every sport and go from there it's more like Okay, with surfing, I felt like I needed more speed and I wanted forgiveness and I wanted chippy and I wanted it just what was my the perfect shortboard in my own head. And I kind of got lucky and made it. And I think honestly, the reason why I got lucky was because I've had so much experience with this, working on boards, helping design boards, being around shapers. And I know I didn't know how to design or shape or build or use any of this stuff. But what I had was the knowledge of what I wanted. And I think if you're ever going to get into shaping, you have to know what you want. You don't know, have to necessarily know how you're going to make it, but you need to know what you want. And I knew exactly what I wanted. It was like a picture in my head. And I basically just went and focused and took my time. And it probably took me like eight hours to shape that first hand shape because I just was like really meticulous. And if I wasn't feeling it, I'd just walk away and then come back and you know, it's not like I'm trying to shape for a living. You know, I get to do it as a hobby or for fun. But if it could elevate my surfing performance, then dang, I really, 
I, 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 I like want to keep doing it. I think that's, I think it's been exciting. And I, uh, what, when's our board's going to be done? Like in a week, couple weeks, maybe. Uh, well, I hope it's done soon, but you know, the funniest thing of that is I tried ordering rice paper and, um, the rice paper is basically like what you, you know, print your logos on. You can put it under the glass and that's what most shapers do. But it, surprisingly, it's very hard to find people that can print on rice paper. There's one person on Maui. There used to be one person on Oahu and now you can actually order it online. But I, you know, it's, I was told it was going to be like four weeks and I'd rather try to get one in two weeks. So the boards have been done, but it, which is kind of nice. I've been going back in there and I've been seeing little things that I might've missed um, and, and changing it. And basically I made you a replica of the one I had, except we made it a little thicker, kept the 19 wide. We would never order a 19 wide board, but it just somehow works. So I was like, don't change it. Then I made myself one like that. And then I ended up messing with the V through the fins out the tail. I've had good success in bigger waves with that. And I figured maybe it would be good for like air reverses. You know, I don't know. We got to try it. And then I went with a crazy bottom concept. Um, basically a V double barrel concave. I had one on my Jaws gun that I used to stand up on the yellow one. It was a 10-4 and a 9-4. And it worked magic in big waves. I might bring it back for big wave surfing. But it was actually Tomo and Firewire that he made some crazy looking boards that he does. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the exact model it was but he had been experimenting with that. And I had been thinking about it for kind of a while. I ended up trying a windsurf board for the world champion Brazino or Marcelio Brown um, through Goya windsurfing. And it had the same sort of bottom and it felt insane off the bottom. I didn't know if I liked it off the top, mainly because the outline was a very windsurf outline, which is wide point forward kind of pulled in in the tail. I like my wide point a little farther back so I can like feel like I'm surfing it a little more off the top. But all that being said, that I'm really excited to test that board because I don't know if it's going to work or not. It looks insane. It might be the biggest dog ever, but then it might be insane too. And depending on how it goes, I'll go down that rabbit hole. But at least I know confidently that I have the single concave pretty dialed in and I can just like either work off that file or or know the ins and outs of when I rehand shape one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I I cannot wait to try that. The, those new ones. Um, But unfortunately like our forecast here is just like there's nothing i think uh, maybe if a hurricane comes <laughs> maybe we'll get some waves but yeah it's been like it, well you're the boards so lucky. usually take a while to cure so you got yeah that. true so yeah we have i guess yeah we won't be too antsy and um yeah i've been jealous of all your travels it's been like it's been pretty darn grindy here but um wait but you yeah, went to I el guess salvador though yeah i did Twice. that was like at the start of yeah that was at the start of summer i did my first trip i went with my you know girlfriend sarah and we went um and just like on a just kind of on a couple's trip we just wanted to go somewhere and we we went there and i surfed a little bit and i came back and then my whole friend group over here just decided on a whim like last second to go chase a swell and i went back and that was just firing so it was it was good i feel like i got all my sort of shortboarding out of my system well so with el salvador um it was like i was kind of scared of going there kind of central america just seemed sketchy a little bit and you know, you went there. I mean, obviously they have a CT there, but I was like, gosh, the last thing I want to do is like get kidnapped or, you know, <laughs> just be in a place. You don't want to like in Mexico is I kind of know it a little better because I've been there quite a bit and you just don't drive at night and you make sure you have a guide and yada, yada. I mean, some people do it a lot more loose than that, but, you know, you just hear horror stories and El Salvador. I was like, gosh, it's the most sketchy place in all of central america i never want to go there and then you started going there and i was like i hope my brother doesn't die <laughs> yeah. and then you ended up coming back saying it was like the most nicest mellow zero crime anywhere and you know it was because the president just locked up all of ms-13 and all the no, gangs insane. and insane yeah yeah it went from like literally there's statistics about this it was one of the most dangerous countries in the world there's like travel advisories and this was only like like a few years ago they've only cleaned it up maybe maybe three or four years ago um and it literally like yeah you're right you didn't want to go there like if you're going to go there you kind of have to know what's going on the gangs basically ran the entire country and you, yeah you're putting yourself in a lot of danger by going there and it just so happens that like they have a kind of a similar setup to how San santa barbara is where it's like the land of right points all these river mouths that come out insane setup so i think surfers have been going there for a long time but yeah, it's been pretty nice. Like, Probably like a it, nice 
some people probably liked that it was dangerous because it kept the crowds yeah. down and yeah, hundred percent. But I heard like crazy stories. One of one of the guys we know from Maui that went there, I think probably in like 2015 or something. He said like he was in the parking lot at Punta Roca, like you know the the CT spot, and there was fully a gunfight, and he had to like run for cover. Jeez, so it was like awful. it was just so gnarly, and it's like not you know putting your life like at risk for like you know it's insane waves but you there's know, no wave there's that's mexico worth your life, yeah. probably yeah probably not the only time the only reason why myself you nathan or any of us are riding the ways we do is because we do think we're gonna survive and there's yeah. really no chance we're gonna die like you kind of go into it, that attitude but you know it's out of your hands when you're on land because i mean just this year even baja mexico i mean you had those i think two australians and one american got killed and it was over something dumb like tires and in the moment it might seem inconvenient but i always mentally prepare myself to just give everything away just in case you're in that position because your life's more valuable than stuff no matter what even if it's your prized possessions like a hand shape board um yeah. and i was yeah. kind of nervous going to south africa and Namib well maybe i'd been there so i knew it was fine but south africa i was like a little bit haired out a little bit um but it felt pretty fine once you were there especially at j bay it felt like you know quiet california town in a way and awesome spot and of course there's the places you don't want to go but that's traveling you just gotta like go with the flow and be friendly to everyone and you know just be there for the right reasons which is usually surfing i think you know once the sun goes down you know nothing good could really happen <laughs> so it's it's always i always keep that in mind so i was like yeah going to el salvador yeah with hearing all those stories yeah it's definitely kind of scary but yeah it's and nowadays it's one of the safest places you can go it's like it's i mean it's obviously still like you like you said you probably don't want to be going wandering around at night or anything like that but um yeah it's pretty cool like i i think we should do a trip there because um it's definitely especially if we want to try a bunch of boards because you will surf yourself out so fast over there it's like there's an endless amount of waves really good vibes it was definitely I go. um now now yeah, i want to like, go yeah by yeah, you next going summer, next summer i want to go. go now i have <laughs> yeah. so many places that i want to travel to and it's obviously a little bit harder being a parent and stuff and just getting up and leaving fortunately it's my job but <laughs> yeah and also you know i want to go surf big waves in random places but then trying to get the support to do that that makes it way more challenging like you got to have like you know a jet ski in a place and you know know someone that knows where that big wave is and that's that's the hard part so you know unless you go full slab tour like nathan and you're just like yeah, all right think, i'm showing up i'm paddling out and i'm going no matter what <laughs> that seems super gnarly i think one of us needs to be, become a billionaire or something somehow so we could get it like a just mega yacht and like go to there's i've seen <laughs> like on google earth it may seem like there's not very many big good big waves in the world you know everyone knows about the big three but there are infinite setups in in oh. some of the places i've seen but they're just Disclose so remote to like, me after the stream. no way well, i have i have a whole list and it, you, you would trip like some of these setups oh, you know it, it and it's hard to tell from google earth too just because like as uh, say you were looking the same maui was somehow undiscovered for waves and you were looking along the coastline like, you could easily gloss right over jaws it Probably. doesn't look any different than any other part of the coastline but it just so happens like what five times a year that wave turns into just the most psycho wave ever and you think about Thank that God it's we like, have okay that we have a backyard <laughs> i know right yeah and you just think about the entire world and like how many areas well, are really I, exposed to huge I think swell. Africa like, probably has yeah. some psycho setups it's just getting there I, we were talking to someone down in namibia about angola which supposedly has yeah. one of the best waves on earth the problem with it was there was landmines all over the beach from the Civil War I've and then another that, war yeah. between Namibia and Angola and the kidnapping super gnarly up there. And this guy was describing to us how he's going to go up there and, you know, try to like stay right at the high tide line and, you know, on his car and try not to hit any landmines. I'm like, that is oh super heavy. <laughs> and then, insane. you know, there's pirates everywhere, too. So you're just like, oh, my God, like there's probably the best waves on earth somewhere that you know is just out of reach really 100 percent, especially big waves just because like yeah you need a lot of variables well, to come together for it to be really good too for it's example, like it's hard to just yeah everyone went to well nazare was thought to be the biggest wave ever and maybe it still is consistently as far as we know and it's nice because it's in europe and it's by the airport and there's a town with the biggest yeah, harbor yeah. ever right but yeah. then like there's that wave down in morocco that I think it's bigger than Nazareth and That's it's what a I've mix heard, between yeah. Mavericks 
and Jaws, you know, it's maybe not as long as Jaws, but it barrels and it, I mean, it peaks up kind of like Mavericks and it's as tall as, and I think it's, it's down in Safi or something in Morocco. And it's just like, you have to get permission. You got to know someone I think to like even launch at that Harbor, but it just goes to show all the biggest waves in the world that I've ever seen are by some sort of like trench, obviously, but even harbors, not that Jaws yeah. is actually by a harbor, but it's by all these. But there's a huge trench. There's just gulches. Of that place. Yeah. But like yeah. Nazare, Mavericks, um, that Morocco wave, it's all like by this giant harbors, which is such a trip. I yeah. wonder how many and, big and, waves have been ruined by massive harbors, possibly. Pro a lot of point breaks have. Like if you think about a point break is like the perfect, like if you didn't, you didn't know anything about surfing, like you'd want to find a point break so then you only have to build one jetty out and you have a perfect harbor and they build harbors that, around yeah. rivers too and tends to be That's rivers true. are like you know i mean they stop the river obviously but like rivers are that what made that trench and what kind of carves out and quick fact about nazare is it's ten thousand feet deep and it's the deepest trench in all of europe and it used to have a huge glacier in it so think about at one wow. time there was just a giant glacier and and i would think about that in like colder regions like chile patagonia um anywhere that's you know either south or really north think about all these huge glaciers that are just carving up big wave spots and if sea le sea levels really gonna rise um <laughs> those are gonna be potential areas to go for sure and, and not I in wanna, our lifetimes i think <laughs> i want to do like a full podcast about nazare because it's just such like i the think lore you have, of nazare there's so much lore and we could talk for like two hours about it but I know I just there's one I, that involves, I don't know if it's true or not, <laughs> but there is, I'm not going to even go totally into it. We'll save it, but just a yeah. sweet, quick sneak peek. Um, some one like, you know, 15 generational local that was on the beach I was talking to told me that, you know, it's like Napoleon had tried to take over Portugal at one point and he chose the worst part of the coastline to come in because he didn't want to go in all the way down at um lisbon because that was like where the main city was but we wanted to start up the coast a little bit which you know by freeway is about an hour and 45 minutes you know by foot probably two days <laughs> yeah. if you're in an army but anyway something tragic happened his whole armada got taken out in that area and i'm pretty yeah. sure nazare <laughs> was the cause of that so we can go deeper into that I love the lore of places. This is kind of our first go at a podcast, but um, yeah, what I want to do for sure is like, yeah, talk about the lore. Like you talk about Jaws, um, Mavericks, Nazare. There's so many crazy the stories. But yeah, just three. getting back to like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, every, everyone knows a ton about those, but there are a lot of stories that no one really knows about that are pretty crazy. And like think about all the crazy stuff that's happened at Nazare that we've never even talked about. The feuds and like, there's just- Oh, the lore. You know, it's crazy, but- We'll get I was into just the like, controversial stories. Yeah. Sure. Just going back to like finding big waves and stuff. Remember that movie Billabong Odyssey when we watched Still one of my kids? favorite movies. I wonder like, if it's you so can watch sick. it on YouTube. Yeah. Like we got to find it. But like the whole premise of that movie, a big part of it was that they were trying to go find the next big wave. And a segment of it was they were in Europe looking for, um, you know, a, a big wave spot they get huge swells there and they were kind of looking around in france and like the beach didn't breaks really, mainly yeah they didn't Possible. really score that hard and little did they know there was a pretty popular tourist town in portugal that had a wave that was twice as big as anything that i don't really know had been ridden at that point it was insane i don't know if they could have ridden it back then I you don't think, think they would have just like pulled up and saw it and been like it no, just would look like nuts. death because it's just yeah. the one the machines back then weren't big and or like powerful enough and there was just no way you could outrun one of those waves on an 800 two stroke cc machine you know and yeah, there's no way <laughs> nowadays the machines are you know 1812 cc 200 or actually more was it 315 horsepower ridge like yeah, just, i think there's 325s now oh yeah so it's makes. like 325 yeah. horsepower and you barely are outrunning it on that so i think those old skis would have been a death wish it, it really like I mean, not that many years later, I guess Garrett McNamara showed up on like a 1200, you know, yeah, probably yeah. 180 horsepower jet ski, you know, <laughs> that's probably where what he ended up riding it in the beginning. But gosh, when you stay on that cliff, you just look, why would like it just doesn't look possible once you yeah, get caught, like, you're done. My, my first time. And yeah, again, we'll talk about this more in the, the 
um that podcast about nazareth but yeah my first time i like went out like i didn't go from the harbor like you picked me up on the beach and like just looking out from the beach like if you showed up and saw it from the first time that from the beach where you're seeing all the white water and all the craziness that's in between the the shore and the actual wave like there's just no way you you'd think you would just die the second you try to go through that so, it's definitely yeah. a place nazareth that if you didn't know it was possible or you had seen it, especially when you're there in person, you wouldn't think you could do it. Like I stand on the beach all the time and I look out and I see 80 foot waves breaking and then 40 foot white waters. And you're like, there's just no way you can make it out of there. It looks relentless, but there's enough of a gap and the skis are powerful enough and you have a crazy enough tow partner. They're going to be able to punch through the biggest white waters ever and somehow get lucky and find a little area to skizzle through and I think really the most scariest part about that place is not surfing the wave. It's like kicking out of the wave and then being on the back of one of those machines because you're just like, I feel, and I've had it happen to me. That's the worst part where I get destroyed on, you know, the jet ski and you just have to get, you know, folded in half. And you're just like, God, this is absolutely the worst part. But it's also kind of cool because it makes it seem gnarly. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely definitely freaking gnarly yeah i i didn't even i don't think i went last year you went for a kind of not like not training a huge swell, day I think, right? it wasn't yeah, really training. that good there was a lot of bad winds and i mean guys got some waves it got decently large but it was just terrible weather and it wasn't worth flying halfway across the world and spending 10 grand on flights yeah. to do it <laughs> um I mean, yeah it was like five grand there and five grand back which isn't a big deal if it's gonna be good but not to surf for an hour and a half with devil wind um, but hopefully this year, you know, hey, that place is best. I swear, October, November. I mean, it gets good all the time, but for wind, that's like the least amount of wind is during that time. And man, you get that place, maybe not 35 foot, which would translate to like 65, 70 feet on the face, but you get it when it's just 50 foot on the face, like 20 to 25 feet glassy. It's actually a really, really good wave. The right and like, left. I like it at like 20 feet. It's like so, so fun. It's so perfect. And, so fun. And everyone's not there to try to break world records because when it's really yeah. big, it's kind of gnarly. Everyone's like fighting in the water and trying to break the world record because <laughs> all their sponsorships are pivotal on breaking the Guinness Book world records. And I mean, one last closing thought on my end for Nazare is it feels like a place where being a big wave surfer is the only you know you're kind of like you matter a little bit because in yeah, town yeah. everyone knows it the passwords to the internet is uh is um you know garrett mcnamara or mcnamara yeah, yeah, everyone yeah. has like formula one paddocks at the harbor red bull mercedes uh you know and then people have their individual ones you know like nick von rupp and uh um sebastian stoitner and everyone has their own little program so it feels very formula one which is very europe and then yeah, you actually going into the country, you know, they're like, what are you, what's your business here in Portugal? And I'm like, I'm going to Nazare. And they're like, yeah, they don't even care if you have, they just like, don't even look at your passport. They don't even look at your passport. They just in there. Yeah. want to, you know, probably watch you on the news that night. So yeah, it's a pretty magical place. If you want to, if you're an up and coming big wave surfer, you should probably spend a lot of time there um, because you can For definitely. Sure learn a lot in a very short time what took me probably 10 years of trying to learn big waves here in maui because it's not as frequent um would have probably given two or three seasons in nazare i would have probably learned it all because you're force yeah. fed it it's forced down yeah. your your throat because it's just whether you so like it or not you're gonna learn <laughs> every day is 15 foot hawaiian and that to me is a big wave still i mean any waves 12 foot or bigger at these spots you should treat like a big wave because you can easily drown in those conditions. And actually, even eight foot Nazare, I feel like you could drown. It's so gnarly Still there. So gnarly. Yeah. It ain't a mush burger, trust me. It's like a avalanche. And yeah, when it's huge, it does kind of look pretty slopey, but there's a freaking lot of power behind these things. What do you so, think? Yeah, ten miles an hour quicker than anywhere else. Yeah, it's un. It has it's unbelievable. to be ten miles an hour yeah. faster. There's really yeah, it's no. Like you're, you're going. You're going so fast, you can barely think about how fast you're going because you're on the edge of My just exploding the whole time. first few waves when I'm out there, it's like uncomfortably fast. Like, yeah. you, I question if it was even rideable or doable. And then you kind of get used to it somehow. Yeah, and then you, it's sick when you, you spend, like, that's why I, ho I hope we get to go to uh, Nazareth in October and start the season there. And then you come back to Jaws and like, 
Jaws is still super nuts and you go but really Jaws fast. Is perfect. But it just feels like you just let loose and be like, oh my God, I know this thing's not going to close out. And I know I'm going to be able to kick out into the channel. Like that's, that's, I, I, I hope we get a good October Nazare swell. Is that be sick to start there? It's a good it's warm like up. Because it's like the perfect way to warm up and just have a ton of confidence going into like the, the Maui season. I, I still like. think I'm most scared out of Jaws though. Yeah, because it's just intimidating. The wall is intimidating. It just looks like yeah a closeout when you're trying to get barreled. And at Nazare, it's like you can't even see the wall because it's such a mountain. It's such a teepee. It's just like biggest A-frame ever. Yeah, like I feel like I feel like towing Nazare. It it is an element of like survival. The wave is gonna do what it wants with you, and it could put you in a crazy position that's sick. But Jaws like towing. It's really easy to to safe surf out there. But I think what you know we try to do and i think what the standard should be for if you're going to tow jaws is that yeah like what you said like you need to put yourself in a position that's really scary and that you're having to face like to even think about getting barreled you have to on a tow board you have to be so much deeper than you think you have to oh, be yeah. looking at 100 yards of wall that you think is going to close out right in front of you and you have to pull the only way it. to get barreled at jaws is to go on what seems like a close out well there's so much to talk about i feel like this was pretty fun. First test run. And hopefully we do more and we talk about interesting stuff. And if anything, this is just a therapy session <laughs> for us. Yeah, if anyone yeah, enjoys sure. it, thank you. Good good yeah. on you. <laughs> hopefully you yeah. do. Uh, if not, we'll still be here. Yeah, we'll be here. Yeah, getting I mean, out sure. all our stories and hopefully <laughs> not problems because, you know, blessed we don't have very many. I had a little